wealthy fiance and then this ex NFL hot young lover. But really, where's the smoking gun here? Just because you're a cheater doesn't make you a murderer. Do you think the jury was just really biased towards Nanette? I know who Nanette paid to have Bill murder. I didn't know about that. So many people's lives were ruined because of what they did. That's what every guilty person does. I'm Chris Anderson, a retired Birmingham homicide investigator. And I know cops don't always get it right. I'm Fatima Silva. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I've seen innocent people thrown in prison. We've teamed up to help families who are convinced their loved ones were wrongfully convicted of murder. When it's over, we either help free an innocent prisoner or help the family face the difficult truth. December 15, 1994. Newport Beach, California. 55-year-old Bill McLaughlin, a wealthy inventor, is gunned down in his own kitchen. There is no forced entry and little physical evidence his disabled son finds the body and calls 911. Newport Beach emergency. Oh, no, no, no. We have an officer on the way to your house right now. Police take an interest in Bill McLaughlin's fiance, 29 year old Nanette Packard. They find out that she had been cheating on the victim with the former NFL player named Eric Naposky. She's also been forging checks in McLaughlin's name which lands her in jail for six months. But there's no smoking gun, and the case goes cold for 15 years. 2009, investigators take a second look at the case. They decide they have enough to prosecute Nanette's former lover, Eric Naposky. 2011, Eric Naposky is tried and convicted of first-degree murder. Afterwards, he tells prosecutors that Nanette Packard orchestrated the whole thing. 2012, Nanette Packard goes on trial for masterminding the murder of her fiance. The case is entirely circumstantial. Prosecutors say she had McLaughlin killed for money and because she was afraid he would find out about her affair with Naposky. The jury convicts her of first degree murder. She is sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. Nanette Packard has been fighting for her freedom ever since. Michelle, tell me this, what is keeping you in this fight after all these years? The main thing is that they never proved my mom guilty. It just feels like such an injustice. I just can't believe I'm here right now. And I'm like so thankful for what you guys do. Oh. Well, thank you for trusting us with that. Hot mess over here, okay. What about you, Shannon? You're not Nanette's biological daughter. So Correct. why are you here in this fight? I met Nanette and Lachelle in eighth grade. Nanette was always just that amazing, glowing, beautiful, fun-loving mom. I wanna see justice for her and for our families because we all wanna be together. At the time of the murder, how old were you? I was seven. Did you know Eric? Yes. And who did you think he was? I knew they were like boyfriend and girlfriend or okay. dating. I mean, did you also understand that your mom was engaged to another man? Yeah. But when you're seven, you don't really like what is engaged? What is like you're yeah. just whatever it is is normal to you because you don't know different. How was your relationship with Bill? We had a great relationship. I remember reading the newspapers with him and we would snuggle on the couch. He was an amazing guy. He was very loving, very kind. It was really hard when he died. What is your first memory about what happened to him? I just have like one minute. I'm sorry. 
They told me that he had been shot six times. And I was like, why didn't he run? Why wouldn't he just run away? To the judge and jury, Nanette was a woman who had her fiance killed for money. Tell us what they're missing. Who is the real Nanette? So my mom was a loving mother. She was always present and gave you the best of her. And she was a really good motivator. She's adventurous. She is a great leader. And she is a really honest person. I've learned so much from Nanette. But we all have bad qualities. Yeah. What are some of the things that you would change about her? Her downfall was with men and cheating. She had a pattern of having an older man with money who was security. And then after a few years, she would end up cheating with a younger, more exciting, passionate type person. It's wrong. But I think that just because you're a cheater doesn't make you a murderer. Yeah. So you guys gave us four leads that you hope would convince us to join your fight. The first lead is that your mother's ex-boyfriend, Eric Naposky, was convicted of this murder. You say that even if the jury got it right, even if he did do it, that doesn't mean that your mom had anything to do with it. So even if he did it, he could have done it on his own. And there was no evidence that proved that she told him to do it. Why would Eric want to kill Bill McLaughlin? I would say maybe jealousy, or maybe he found out that my mom and Bill were engaged. Now, your next lead is that the main witness in this case was not credible. Who is this witness? This witness was Suzanne Kogar. She was Eric's neighbor at his apartment. So what exactly did she testify to that was so damaging? So she said that she had asked him did you have anything to do with this murder? And he said, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. So how is this information incriminating towards your mother? I mean, if anything, it just makes it look like he might have acted alone. So the other part of her statement was that she said that Eric told her, that my mom told him that Bill had made sexual advances towards her. Then she said that Eric said, I'm so mad I could blow up his plane. So you're saying Eric didn't know that your mom was engaged to Bill? No. So why do you think this witness wasn't credible? I don't understand why she came out 14 years later, as well as that her statements get more detailed, new things kind of start surfacing. It just doesn't seem credible. Your next lead is that Nanette has no financial motive to want Bill dead. If anything, she had financial motive to keep him alive. Explain that to me. Bill was a very wealthy man. Nanette was not going to inherit that fortune. All she stood to gain was a $1 million life insurance policy. To a lot of people, a $1 million is an exorbitant amount of money. Mm -hmm. Here it buys you a very ugly home. Now your next lead is that the jury didn't convict Nanette because of the evidence. They convicted her because they just didn't like her. Explain that. So the, the prosecution and the defense attorney both painted my mother in a very horrible light as a gold digger, a cheater. So she was convicted because in their eyes, she was just a young woman who used an older wealthy man. Yes, I think the character assassination is what made them make that decision. Do you ever think about what it would be like to have your mother home again? It'll be like the best day of our life. <laughs> I dream about it all the time. <laughs> I'll probably be like this, <laughs> crying <laughs> a lot and hugging her and praising God. You don't really realize what you're missing until it's gone. And I think having her back, it would just be so amazing. The next door to say that if Eric Naposky is responsible for Bill's death, he did it by himself. I'm going to be asking Eric a lot of questions about his relationship with Nanette. Because for me to believe that he acted alone, he's got to really separate himself from Nanette at the time of the murder. 
I got you, Eric. How you doing, sir? I'm well, Chris. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Let's start off with Nanette. When did you meet Nanette? I met Nanette when I first arrived in Orange County, and I began a fitness program at a local gym. What type of person was she when you first met her? I think she um, put off an air of snobbiness. Pretty girl who probably knew it. How long was it before you two became romantically involved? We didn't become romantically involved until New Year's Eve in 1994. Would you consider yourself to be in love? Would you consider yourself to be in love? Uh, definitely by the end of 94, yeah. I think without a doubt I loved her. Uh, I believe it was reciprocal. Do you think this is headed towards a serious relationship, a marriage, or I hope engagement? It is. Or? I hope it is, yeah. An important part of this story is that only a couple weeks before Bill was murdered, Nanette was at my house in New York with her kids for Thanksgiving, and her kids were sitting on the laps of my parents. A few days later, I was in Washington, D.C. at her sister's wedding. I will always look at that time as a good time because I didn't know any better. Do you think that she deceived you into thinking she was someone else? I think her whole life was a deception. The life that she put forward and the life that she actually had were two totally different things. I knew nothing about the relationship between her and Bill. Zero. What did she say about Bill? You know, she told me that she had a business partner named Bill McLaughlin. Uh -huh. He was her mentor and he invented certain things. At what point did you realize that she was engaged to Bill? After Bill was murdered, the newspaper referred to her as his fiance. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that she would be with an old guy like that. Did she ever tell you that Bill was coming on to her? Yes. I think that's evident in my conversation with Susan Cogar, and I would have had no reason to make that up and tell Suzanne Cogar what Nanette told me if Nanette really never told me that. Did Suzanne Cogar tell the truth when she said that you were pissed about Bill coming on to her? Absolutely. I was angry. Did Nanette ever ask you to murder Bill? No. I don't believe she ever said, um, go murder Bill. Then what did she say? I think it was more like, I want him dead. Do you believe that she is responsible for his death? No, I don't believe she's responsible for Bill's death. I know she's responsible for Bill's death. She's not the person that pulled the trigger because she has an alibi. So if she didn't pull the trigger, who would have? There's obviously a third person out there, right? I, I don't know. There's a third party person that committed a crime that I'm sitting in prison doing his his time. Do you know who's responsible for Bill McLaughlin's murder? I know who Nanette paid to have Bill murdered. What? Wow. I don't know who went into Bill's home and shot him. I know who she paid to have it done. Yes. So who was it? I'm not just going to start pointing the finger at people that are sitting out there and get them all riled up because there's the people who leave dead people in the kitchen. Do you get that part of it? Well, let me ask you this. After the time that you knew that Nanette was engaged to this millionaire man and he's been murdered, why was it that you still stood beside her? You want to know why I was hanging with my girlfriend after she murdered somebody, but you can't tell me why a policeman took the stand and said that we never checked his alibi. Eric, Eric, stop. What you're doing is deflecting. My job is to talk to you about the relationship. I don't have the police here. I have you here. When you start deflecting and asking, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? That's what every guilty person does. Eric. Who killed Bill McLaughlin? Was it you? It was definitely 100% positively not me. I didn't know Bill McLaughlin. I didn't have a reason to murder Bill McLaughlin. If Bill McLaughlin is dead, it's because of the person who was living in Bill's house, who was collecting a million dollar insurance policy, who was stealing money, who was driving Bill's cars, who was telling lie after lie, who was cheating on Bill, there's only one person in the world who could be responsible for Bill's death.
Lachelle believes the jury didn't convict her mom because of the evidence, but because she was a young, pretty woman engaged to a rich, older man. Can something like this really prejudice a jury? I'm meeting with a psychologist who just put this theory to the test. So I understand that you conducted an experiment earlier today to see how much those things can influence people. Tell me about that test. We sat down with three groups, each consisting of three volunteers. I showed each group a completely different picture of the exact same model. I told each group five different facts about Nanette Packard. But here's the thing, Fatima. I did not give them any information about the evidence in the case. Okay. At the end, I asked each volunteer on a scale of one to 10, how capable they thought she was of masterminding this murder. So you said it was three different photos. Can I see the first one? Oh, so this is your down to earth, next door neighbor kind of girl. So what were the five facts you gave along with this photo? Jessica is 29 years old. Her fiance, David, is almost 30 years older and he is very wealthy. Jessica has two children from a previous marriage. She loves baking cookies and taking her kids on spontaneous adventures. So on a scale of one to 10, how likely was she capable? So on a scale of one to 10, how likely was she capable? I would go with four. Three. I would put her at a seven. Did the volunteer who said seven say why? She actually said that it was because of the age difference. Her husband was older and wealthier. What was the picture that you showed to the second group? Oh. Okay, so you told them she was 29 and engaged to an older rich man. What else? She does have a very natural business sense and enjoys drafting business plans. So a very different scenario here. What did they say on this one? Six. Four. I'd say a nine. She just looks the part to me and a little bit like, I'm getting away with this and there's nothing you can do about it kind of thing, you know? Now, how about the last photo? The vixen. Jessica met David after posting an ad in a newspaper looking for wealthy men only. During her relationship with David, Jessica had multiple affairs, including an affair with an ex-NFL player. So these are basically the same facts that were given in Annette's case. That is correct. What did the group say about this photo? I'd say just based on the picture, like an eight or a nine. 10. Mm, we'll go with a six. What reason did the 10 give? She definitely looks like a man-eater, like the femme fatale that all the men, you know, lust after. I don't necessarily approve of that, so maybe I am biased. So then based on this test, do you think that the convict's family's right when they argue that the jury was just really biased towards Nanette based on facts that actually weren't related to the crime? Absolutely. We saw that today. All of them were given so little information, and some of them were very convinced and they were ready to convict. Shannon says Bill was worth more to Nanette alive than dead. I'm going to dig deep into their finances to see if this is true. How much was Bill McLaughlin worth at the time of the murder? Well, according to the testimony of his CPA, he was worth between 20 and $54 million at the time of his death. Now, I know about the mansion that Bill had in Newport Beach, but what else did he own? Well, Bill also had a beach house in Newport Beach, and he had two houses in Las Vegas. He also had a plane because he was an avid flyer, and that was one of his hobbies, uh, and a boat as well. What about Nanette? How much was she worth? Nanette was basically worth little to nothing. So what did she stand to make if he died? As far as his will goes, she was allowed to live in one of his properties for a year, and she was also named on a $1 million life insurance policy. So Nanette's family argues that she had no financial incentive to murder Bill. She said that he was actually worth more to her alive than dead. Is that true? Yes, that's basically true. As long as they stayed together. 
In the murder trial, the prosecution alleged that Nanette was worried Bill was about to or had already found out about her embezzlement. Yeah, and I want to talk about that too, because I know that she did some time for forging some checks from Bill. What time frame was she embezzling money? Well, this is a district attorney's complaint that was filed, and the time period that they looked at and they determined was between January of 1994 and the time of Bill's murder in December of 1994. And what was the amount? $341,000. The big one you'll see at the bottom, though, is that there's a check dated one day before the murder for $250,000. Hmm. Is it possible Nanette was writing these checks with Bill's permission, maybe to pay bills and household expenses? It doesn't seem plausible because, especially the $250,000 check, that seems like a lot of household expenses for a short period of time. Chris, the problem with this case is it's really hard not to have a bias when you're looking at the basic facts. Young, beautiful woman, older, wealthy fiance, and then this ex-NFL hot young lover. But really, where's the smoking gun here? So I can understand why it took 15 years for them to actually put charges against Nanette and Eric for that matter. And even then, 15 years later, I mean, we don't have an admission from Nanette. We don't have a murder weapon that links her to it in any way. There's no money transfer between her and Eric. So there's still this possibility that one can assume he's just a jolted lover. Tomorrow I speak with Nanette, and she's going to have to clear up a lot of information for me to get behind this case. The biggest thing I'm looking for is she has to separate herself from Eric. So I'm actually going to get to sit down with Suzanne Kogar tomorrow, and she's the key witness to this entire case. She's definitely the reason the case was reopened all these years later. She basically says that Eric made an admission to her, that he wanted Bill dead. So I really want to see how credible she is. Lachelle and Shannon both brought us in, and they said that they wanted the truth. So tomorrow's interviews will be key. I have been thinking of Lachelle every single day, and it just breaks my heart what she's been through. And there's no doubt that Nanette was an amazing mother to her. But she brought us here to learn the truth. And so I'm just hoping that that's what we can give her, no matter which way it falls. On this call with Nanette, I'm going to ask her some hard questions. There is documentation that suggests after Bill's murder, Nanette was purchasing items that may or may not have been for Eric. So I'm going to really dig into their relationship because that's the most important piece of this entire investigation for me. Hello, Nanette. Hello, Chris. Let's get started here. Tell me this, what attracted you to Bill? He was um, really driven and successful, and he was a businessman, and I really loved that, and he really liked the fact that I wanted to learn from him. He was a family man, which I loved. He just had all the things that would make a good partner. When did the affair start with Eric Naposky? Um, I had known Eric for a little while. We used to um, work out together, and we were friends. I actually wasn't attracted to him at all at first because he was kind of arrogant. Were you in love with him? Not love. I mean, it was lustful. We had fun together. Did Eric know about the relationship between you and Bill? He knew we lived together. Um, he knew we went on trips together. But did I tell him, oh, I'm engaged to him and all this? No, I didn't. If there was a lot of lust for Eric, why didn't you end the engagement with Bill? Because I loved Bill too, as dumb as that sounds. And Bill was secure and a good family man. And he would be there for me in the way that I needed, that I never had growing up. He would be someone I could rely on. I could not rely on him.
Nanette is in prison because of the testimony of one key witness, Suzanne Kogar. But Lachelle says she's not credible because she took so long to come forward. I track Suzanne down, and what she tells me today could be the key to this entire case. How did you meet Eric Naposki? We both lived in the same apartment complex, and we met at the pool. And what was he like? He was a bold guy, bold personality. He was friendly. Now, from what I understand, he was dating someone at the time, Nanette Packard. Did he ever talk about her? He didn't at first. I used to see her around about every other weekend or so. And he was rather vague and secretive about his relationship with her, which I found really odd. And what did she seem like? She seemed extremely uninterested in being friendly and talking to anyone else. When did you first hear about Bill? So after a few months of knowing Eric, he came over to my place and finally he admitted that he was in love with her. And then he told me that she lived with this man named Bill McLaughlin. He was her business partner. He said that she had been complaining to Eric that Bill had been making unwanted sexual advances on her. So then he tells me a little more about Bill, about him having a second home in Las Vegas, and he had his own private plane. And he said, when he flies to Vegas, I'm gonna have his plane blown up. He seemed very serious. Nikki had a plan. Like he had a plan. I became very uneasy around him at that point. Now, I understand that you and Eric were together the day that Bill was murdered. Yes, we were. Where were you? My son had a championship soccer game. Who left with you? Well, Eric had driven up with me, so he left with me. Okay, what about your children? My children left with their dad. I took Eric, dropped him off at his house in Tustin so that he could get ready and go to work. So I went to South Coast Plaza to do some Christmas shopping because during the holidays they stay open till like 10 o'clock. Okay. Now, after Bill's murder, did you purchase anything for Eric? I bought him some cowboy boots. Uh-huh. I understand that uh, a week after Bill's death, you bought three motorcycles. Who were those for? I had already put a deposit on those weeks before for myself and my son. Uh -huh. How many did you buy? Because I, I, I read that there were three. There were three. I had two kids, myself. So you bought a motorcycle for your daughter, your son, and yourself? No, she was too little to ride by herself. And then who was the other one for? So for if Bill was with me, or at the time I was seeing Eric, if Eric was with me. I know this really makes me look like a terrible person. I'm Like I said, I'm really not proud of this behavior. Okay, but I'm just telling you the truth. And the truth makes me look bad, so they convicted me of something that I didn't do. I would rather you be completely honest with me about it. Now, I'm gonna, I'll ask you that question again. Did you purchase the bike for Eric? Um, okay, so technically for him to ride sometimes, yeah. Now, at some point you find out about the murder of Bill McLaughlin. When did you find that out? I found out in January sometime. He knocked on my door and he said, have you seen any cops around here? And I said, oh, why Why would cops be looking for you? And then he said, well, Bill McLaughlin was, was killed. I said, I don't even want to know if you had anything to do with it. And he said, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Wow. Mm -hmm. And how are you feeling the moment you close that door and he's gone? Oh, I couldn't get it locked fast enough. You believed he had something to do with it? Absolutely did. What do you do with this information? I mean, I wanted to call the police right then, but with Eric in the area, I was afraid to. And I knew he had a security company. He had guys working for him that all carried guns. I understand at some point you do reach out to the police. Tell me about that. I, a couple months later, I did call the police. A receptionist answered and she said, well, there's no one here who can take your statement. And I even said to her, I have information about a murder in Newport Beach. And she just casually kept saying, no, you can call back. So did you? So, no. 
I took that as a sign that it was not the right time for me to have my name out there. When do you talk to the police again about this case? I didn't call back until two and a half years later. Do they take your statement this time? They did, yes. How does it feel today knowing that because of your testimony, they're both behind bars? I think about it almost every day. Almost every day. So many people's lives were ruined because of what they did. Bill died. His daughters were destroyed over it. Nanette's and Eric's children were affected by it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for them. But I, I don't apologize. They made these decisions. They ruined their own lives. So you have no doubt that Eric Naposki killed Bill McLaughlin? I have no doubt. And Nanette, she masterminded the whole thing. Is it possible that you may have said something to Eric that set him off? Maybe you didn't even mean for him to do anything, but he misunderstood it and did something crazy. No, because I never really talked about him. I could not have set him off intentionally, and I never told him that, that crazy Suzanne Kogar statement. I never said anything like that. Have you ever considered that Eric may have been lovesick and he just wanted you to himself? And that would be the reason why he would do something like this to Bill. Originally, I did not think that. Now, I'm not so sure. Either I got two people sitting here lying to me, or I've got one that's lying. We'll catch up to you. Well, so if you're not involved, you can't catch up to me because I didn't do anything. I really wish I had the answers for killing me too. Because if I knew, I would tell you. I would tell somebody. I'm sitting across two women of very strong faith who both fiercely believe in Nanette but are committed to finding the truth. So I'm really grateful that you trusted us to investigate this case. The two of you gave us four leads that you hoped would persuade us to join your fight. We've looked into each one of those leads and here are the results of our investigation. Now, your first lead that you gave us was that the jury was tainted. You said that because the prosecution and even Nanette's own defense attorney portrayed her as a greedy gold digger, the jury convicted her because they didn't like her, not because of the facts of the case. So I decided to put this to the test. I flew in an independent behavioral psychologist and we conducted an experiment. We had three different groups of three volunteers. Each one was shown a different picture of the same model. As you can see, in one photo, the model was the girl next door. In the next, she was a businesswoman. And in the third, she was a seductress. Every group was told that the model was 29 and that she was engaged to a wealthy man who was about 30 years older than her. For the girl next door photo, we also told them that she had two daughters and she loved to bake. For this one, we said she helped her fiance with his business endeavors. And for the Vixen, we told the volunteers that she had several affairs, including one with an ex-NFL player. We then asked each volunteer to tell us between one to 10, how likely it was that the woman they were looking at might have masterminded the murder of her husband. Now remember, we didn't give them a single fact about the murder. For the girl next door, the average response was 4.7. Hmm. For the businesswoman, 6.3. And for the seductress, 8.2. In the end, we had volunteers who were ready to convict without knowing a single thing about the actual murder. She definitely looks like a man-eater. I don't necessarily approve of that, so maybe I am biased. So, this is a good lead. I think it is fair to say that jurors might have been influenced by how they felt about Nanette as a person. Well, I like hearing that one lead is valid but i mean it makes me sad that she came off that way because i like knew the real her you know your next lead is that nanette had no reason to kill her fiance that bill mclaughlin 
was worth more to her alive than dead. So I went to an independent forensic accountant to see if that was really true. As you know, McLaughlin was worth somewhere between 20 and $54 million. He had two houses in Newport, two big houses in Vegas, a plane and a boat. All she stood to gain if he died was a $1 million life insurance policy and a $150,000 that was written into his will. And as you said earlier, Shannon, all that will buy you in Newport Beach is an ugly house. But for Bill to be worth more to her alive, they would have to stay together. And there's something else to consider. About a year after Bill's murder, Nanette sues his estate for palimony. She claimed that they had an oral agreement and that she was entitled to half the money he made while they were together. So if Nanette believed she could win millions from this suit and collect on the $1 million insurance policy and stay in the beach house, we can no longer say she felt he was worth more alive than dead, especially if she had reason to fear that Bill would break up with her and probably leave her with nothing. So unfortunately, this lead's not gonna work. I didn't know about that. And we're talking millions. Now, your next lead is that the main witness in this case, Suzanne Kogar, is not credible. You said she waited 14 years to come forward and her story kept changing. Now, I managed to track down Suzanne. I needed to gauge her credibility for myself. Turns out, Suzanne actually did not wait 14 years to come forward with this information. She says she waited a few months at first because she was afraid of Eric. When she finally did call the police department, a formal statement was never taken. A few years later, in 1998, she reached out again, and this time they did take her statement. As far as her story changing, the story that she told me was basically the same one she testified to. Oh, you're a good friend, Shannon. I'm just gonna give you a little hug. Let me have some So let's move on to your last lead. And it's really the key to this entire case. You guys say that if Eric Naposky killed Bill McLaughlin, he did it alone. That he was an obsessed, jealous lover who flipped out when he found out that Nanette was engaged. Now, I got the chance to talk with Eric. He said that he was in love with your mom. All these years later, he still feels betrayed by her. He doesn't understand why she never told him that she was engaged. He also insists that he had nothing to do with Bill's murder. Now, we're not here to look at Eric's case. We're here to look at your mom's case. But we have to accept to some degree that these cases are intertwined. If Eric did it alone, why was he coincidentally with Nanette the night that Bill was murdered? And why was she buying him gifts a week after her fiance was gunned down? Nanette's behavior before the day of and after the murder makes it very hard to believe Eric just went off and did this on his own. So unfortunately, this lead will not get you anywhere. Here are the facts that we really can't dispute. Nanette was engaged to an older rich man. She was stealing from him. She was also cheating on him with Eric, but she never told Eric the truth about her relationship with Bill. A month before Bill's murder, she and Eric were on the East Coast meeting each other's families. The night that Bill was shot, Nanette and Eric left your brother's game together. Nanette originally lied to police about being with him that night. At the crime scene, there's no forced entry. Somehow, the killer had keys to the security gate at the house. Your mom is coincidentally missing that security gate key from her key ring. A week later, Nanette buys him a motorcycle. A month later, Eric makes incriminating statements to Suzanne Kogler. A jury of nine women and three men took in these little puzzle pieces, and it didn't take long for them to come back and say it added up to murder. 
This is a classic circumstantial case, but we're not here to relitigate your mom's trial. It's done. To get a new trial, she needs new evidence that proves her innocence. And short of Eric Naposky doing a 180 and saying he did this alone, I just don't see how that's gonna happen. So unfortunately, this isn't a case we can get behind. Fatima and I hate to deliver bad news, but as women of faith, you know, I want to be on the right side of truth and justice. So I'll ask you to really think about what you've heard here tonight. She might have been an amazing mom, but clearly when it came to men, she had a lot of demons. It's hard to take on mm -hmm. when we're wanting to know truth. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I started out the week like every child should start out, presumption of innocence. And the more I kept digging, the worse it looked. And all I kept thinking about was you. Because I can't imagine being in your shoes. Let me just like catch my breath. The one thing that I said coming in is that I would want the truth. And I do feel like the truth sets you free. I would suggest you have a conversation with Nanette. Yeah. And just talk to her. Let her know you'll always be in her corner. If she's responsible, she should work to free you both because it's not fair. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>